All right, thanks everybody for coming back to our second panel. It was so much fun in the first panel. I can't wait to see what happens for the second one. Um, we're going to be hearing about the frontiers of machine learning, which is a great segue, I think, from the topics that were discussed in the last panel. Uh, the moderator of this panel is Kevin Leighton Brown. Uh, Kevin is a professor at the University of British Columbia and has spent some time in the lab uh, on sabbaticals. Uh, we, we all really appreciate his uh, expertise. He has a lot of work at the intersection of machine learning and economics, and he has uh, won the Edelman Prize for uh, his work in the FCC Spectrum auctions, which he designed along with his students and Paul Milgram uh, to sell Spectra to the uh, for the, the auctions, the recent Spectrum auctions. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Kevin Leighton Brown. Thanks very much. <laughs> well, it's really a joy to be here at one of the uh, you know, great meeting places uh, you know, in our field for uh, really interdisciplinary, uh, you know, top-notch work. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's also a joy to be here with uh, this distinguished panel. So. Uh, I'd like to begin by asking each member of the panel to briefly introduce themselves, um, briefly, uh, <laughs> and say something about their, their affiliation and their connection to machine learning, and then we'll dive in. Hi, I'm Anima Anand Kumar. Uh, I'm a professor at Caltech as well as director of machine learning. Oh. Sorry, can you hear me now? Hi, I'm Anima Anand Kumar. I'm a professor at Caltech as well as a director of machine learning research at uh, NVIDIA. And I work at the intersections of theory and practice of uh, machine learning. You know, I have a lot of connections to this lab. Uh, you know, this has been such a nurturing and atmosphere. In prime stages of my career, uh, Jennifer and Christian have been amazing mentors. Uh, you know, some of the early work, the first work I did on my core area of research on tensors started here, <laughs> uh, right in this building. So a lot of great memories of this place, and uh, it's amazing that it's been 10 years. <laughs> Congratulations. So I'm Victor Chernozukov. We can't hear you too well. Maybe the mic We're going to see whether the learning panelists can learn to turn their mics on. <laughs> <laughs> We've had two training examples now. Is it on? Can you hear me? No. no. Oh. Uh, Is it on? It's on. OK, well, we sort out that mic. Let's keep moving down the line, and we'll come back to you. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. All right, hello. <laughs> oh, yeah, drop out. Bring it closer. Is this on now? Yeah, now I think it's on, because I hear it making noise. What is here? Maybe I, maybe I have to show us. Can yeah, you, can you, so yeah. I think the mics are quite yeah. directional, so if you have it off to the side, you're going to have to be careful not to look the other way. <laughs> 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 it's a big room. I know people in the back really appreciate the mics working. Maybe you just hold yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm <laughs> yeah, I am, yeah. Move okay, the yeah. Mic with yeah. Your head. yeah. So I'm uh, yeah, I'm an econometrician. Um I'm, I my ma main job is over. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um I, I come from the MIT economics department. I also represent here the Center for Statistics and Data Science, uh, which we created uh, several years ago. Um, and uh, I'm have been involved in uh, creation of various uh, programs, educational programs and statistics. Um, I, I, my, my field is econometrics, which I define as the intersection of economics with machine learning. Um, the field exists, uh, you know, like it's 100 years old or so. Um, and the, at, the, at, the, at the beginning, the, uh, the, 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 the roots of the field were always involved with causal inference. The early, uh, the early. Uh, <laughs> 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 I think your mic is not working. <laughs> So the, uh, the, the, the first incantations started to work on inference uh, for causal problems. It was uh, in the context of supply and demand, and the field is defined by this. And this is, uh, to, to this day, this is one of the most interesting, exciting topics uh, and areas in machine learning. And uh, um, I myself did a bit of work in, in, the, in that area. So some of the, uh, uh, some of the work of uh, the most ex exciting work from my personal view, I did actually 
while visiting here at Microsoft a couple of years ago. So some of this work on device machine learning for causal inference I did actually here in the MSR labs, which I really appreciate. <laughs> so Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Lester Mackey. I'm one of the newest researchers here at Microsoft Research New England. Hello. This is switching you can you hear me now? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm Lester Mackey. I'm one of the newest researchers um, here at Microsoft Research New England. I joined two years ago. Um, before that, I was a professor at Stanford in statistics and computer science. My background is machine learning. Um, I work on methodology, theory, modeling. A lot of the problems I work on these days stem from healthcare, um, some weather and climate forecasting, high energy physics, um, the social good more broadly. Um, yeah, so I'm glad to be here. All right. Does my microphone work out of the box? <laughs> oh, that's. You see, I've been sabotaging everybody else. And I'm trying to move away from Lester because I think his microphone is picking me up. Um, uh, so I'm Nicola Fusi. I'm a researcher here uh, in New England. Uh, I've joined this lab now three years ago, which seems, uh, seems longer. Uh, I mean, I've had. <laughs> As we were saying last night at dinner, you know. Time moves fast when you have fun. I w I've been having fun, but still, it feels like more than three years. Um, You've done a lot. Done some. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a machine learning researcher by training. I got very interested in computational biology. So I worked a lot on statistical genetics, uh, kind of genome-wide decision uh, studies methodology. Then I moved to functional genomics with CRISPR gene editing. And then I kind of went back to machine learning, working on high-dimensional Bayesian optimizations, which uh, as you know, under the name has been wrapped under the name of automated machine learning now, and uh, no, I, I think I think that the New England lab is one of the few places in the world where one can move from statistical genetics to then doing some CRISPR gene editing using machine learning to improve that, obviously, and then moving back to machine learning without serious career consequences. Uh, <laughs> in fact, like moving from field to field is, I feel like it's encouraged. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's great to be here. All right, thanks everybody. So, so as you guys can see, we're uh, already modeling to you the way we intend to continue, which is to be very informal. Um, uh, <laughs> hopefully maybe uh, with working microphones from now on. Uh, so we're going to encourage the panelists to um, make brief statements, kind of jump in uh, as they see fit on each question, to speak more than once to each question if they so choose. Uh, so don't, don't think that people are being unruly and bold when they do this. This is uh, the way we've asked them to do it. Uh, so we're meant to be talking about the frontiers of machine learning. Uh, it's no surprise that uh, you know, to any of you here that machine learning is having a moment, that you know, computer science is suddenly finding that machine learning is kind of an animating principle of the decade, that so much is changing about the way we work with data and the way uh, systems are able to self-organize based on that kind of data. Um, it's almost a roadmap for where our, our field is going as a whole, sort of the way it positions itself relative to machine learning. So, so we have a weighty obligation, panelists, to uh, chart the course here. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to begin by um, thinking about the frontiers by looking back. So uh, I'd like to begin by asking each of you, um, you know, with respect to your own work, your own disciplinary perspective, uh, to think about where you were 10 years ago with respect to machine learning and what has happened in the last 10 years that you found personally surprising from the perspective of breakthroughs in machine learning? Yeah. I mean, I can name quite a few. Like 10 years ago, you know, I was uh, barely at the time of graduation. It was also, you know, in terms of the overall conditions, there was recession. There were hardly any, you know, uh, jobs in computer science. Or that's what it seemed like, right? So I was so lucky to get an academic job that taught at UC at that, <laughs> that year. And now, a decade later, I mean, the opportunities for people in machine learning are just seem endless. There is uh, so many great positions in industry. I mean, every university wants to hire more in machine learning. So in terms of opportunities, uh, it seems a lot. So right? you find but the prospect for employment in machine learning <laughs> personally surprising. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, it's not surprising, but there's been a very big shift. I mean, it's, uh, and it's happened much sooner than I thought. And there has indeed been progress, like, you know, what we thought in terms of can we train these neural networks at this scale and really get up to these levels of uh, performance in practice. That has been surprising to everybody. 
right? And that's where I would like to kind of, you know, I've been on both the extreme ends of the spectrum. I've done theory, really thought deeply about, you know, what kinds of machine learning problems are hard, what is the complexity of these problems. And being at Amazon and now at NVIDIA, I see extremely practical things where we have to launch a product very soon. We have lots of other constraints. We have customers having requirements. And so you have to kind of also make do with what's currently there, right? You can't always uh, think about pushing the frontiers in the next, say, five years or so. So being on the two sides, what I've seen is we need more research in the middle ground. Uh, you know, so there is, uh, I felt that in a way some of the theory was holding us back because there was a lot of pessimism. You know, there was even a paper in my own field of tensors with the title, all tensor problems are NP hard. Right, so, and whenever I would tell people about my tensor algorithm and our tensor method that uh, you know we were very excited about, people will be like, "But I thought these are NP hard problems, right?" So, and it was a similar thing with neural networks. A lot of empirical researchers for decades felt like they were pulled away from it because many people thought it was impossible. And uh, so, I have a lot of respect for practitioners and the early engineers who really said, "Let's just." make it work. I mean, maybe it looks hacky, maybe it's not, it doesn't like seem to follow all the principles, but just let's see how to make it work, right? So that's a great starting point. And, you know, I would not, you know, I have a lot of respect for that. And now the question is, how do we nurture that into a much bigger thing? Uh, and that's where we need like research on robustness on, you know, the uh, how to do it with less data, how to do it in a lot of different domains, uh, how to scale up the problem. Let, let's not do the whole panel in one yeah. question here. Right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right, right now, we want to, we want to think, you know, looking back yeah. last 10 years, yeah. co as concretely as possible, Got what it. surprised you? So uh, 10 years ago, I was starting my second year of graduate school. And I was spending about half of my time working on legitimate research and half of it working on this um, Netflix prize problem that Netflix had recently come out with which was to solve their recommendation problem, and they would say they would give you a million dollars if you did that, so that was, you know, that was appealing to a graduate student. And um, I remember thinking, so I remember thinking just a year prior, when I was deciding you know, where to go to graduate school, what to do, that I had flirted a bit with a lot of disciplines in computer science, so um, I, th I spent some time doing research in programming languages, some time doing research in theory, and those both seemed interesting to me, but nothing seemed to be like, quite the right fit, and when I encountered machine learning actually via this Netflix prize, this problem of, I see what ratings you've given movies in the past, how can they predict what you're going to rate a movie in the future? I thought, well, this is perfect, and this is the future because it combines people, you know, we information for people about the data they express. Um, it combines you know, mathematical modeling, via statistics, um, and, and algorithms, all the best parts of computer science and math and people to me. And I was just shocked by the idea that, wow, we can learn so much about people from their data and I just wanted to explore that more, and that's what got me really into that, you know, that competition, but also into machine learning to begin with. And so this is not really an answer to your question because I would think I'm not at all surprised about what's happened to machine learning. It seemed to me at that point that like this would be the future that everyone should want to be in this field. It just seemed incredible, and it seemed like they had a lot of potential, both um, you know taking theory and translating into practice. Um, and I think we're seeing more and more of that. Yeah. So. In one thing that I think about, so 10 years ago, I was in high school. No, that's not, that's a joke. <laughs> but, but almost, almost, it's close. Uh, plus or minus five years. Um, uh, so if you, if you think about the machine learning papers that were accepted to NIPS uh, or top machine learning conferences in general 10 years ago, you would see a lot of them were, well, at least in probabilistic machine learning, were a graphical model, put distributions over things, and then three pages of gradients. Like, uh, how, how, do you, how do you learn the thing? That was, you know, people got, then got interested in probabilistic programming, so a lot of that got automated. But if you think about it, in the course of 10 years, we kind of eliminated, via various techniques, a bunch of those pages of papers. So now people kind of give the, take them for granted. So there was a very, very clear process of make it work, make it fast, and then make it, like, very easy to use. And if you think, if you look at the papers that, are submitted to ICLR, ICML these days, they build on this giant stack of pretty solid, automated, complex work. Uh, uh, there are all these probabilistic programming libraries that you can use, and you can just build more complex 
constructs and concepts and models in a fraction of the time. And I think that's um, paying dividends for the field. So we are, we are getting through this crazy exponential growth phase in, in terms of interesting measurable ideas that wouldn't have been possible if we we're still all deriving gradients for our liter <laughs> model. Um, so the first one was probably the first time I used Theano, which was coming out, I think, from Mila, uh, maybe. Um, Theano was this library that would you would specify uh, variables and it would kind of do the gradients for you. You could just uh, specify any model pretty much, but it was slower the first time I tried it. And then I tried it a year after, it was faster. And, and now we have crazy toolkits to do. All right, do you, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, so ten, ten years ago, we started to work on um, trying to uh, essentially yeah, instrumental variable uh, regression model where you uh, use machine learning that specifically generalize regression methods to, to uh, proxy the uh, optimal instrument. So uh, not many know, people know the context here, but, uh, but yeah, so IP regression is uh, one of the main tools in like in <coughs> metrics. And the idea is that, say, you want to estimate the demand demand curve, you need uh, instruments to shift the supply curve around so you can trace out the, uh, uh, the moves of the equilibrium quantity along the demand curve. So you really need good instruments and machine learning things to, 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 to build good instruments. Um, what was uh, actually fascinating at, at that time that there were many machine learning tools without any theory. But you, you press a button, things work, but there's no theory. And things seem to work amazingly well in high dimension as well. So I thought that was a good opportunity to, to build some theoretical theory around it, focusing on our kind of All right, so um, still looking 10 years back, let, let's now talk about what you found, uh, you know, what you would have thought would be working by now that, you know, turns out to have been a disappointing failure. <laughs> and what, uh, you know, what in retrospect has turned out to be much harder than you would have thought that would be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought an answer, and then I thought, ooh, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> but, but here you go. Um, all right. Please, please don't throw stuff at me. Uh, re reinforcement learning. Uh, <laughs> no, OK. So I think when I first started looking into reinforcement learning, I thought, oh, th uh, we are you know, almost, it's one of those times where you think, I'm, I'm out basically out of a job. Like, people are figuring it out as we speak. And then, and so by the time I end up contributing something, it's going to be solved. Um, that hasn't been the case. So in some sense, it's uh, it, people are making a lot of progress, but there is still a lot of work to do. And it, so in some sense, it's getting interesting now. Uh, I, I remember being at a NIPS workshop on the frontiers of reinforcement learning 15 years ago that was everybody bemoaning the fact that there was almost nothing realistic that you could do with reinforcement learning. And that certainly has changed. I mean, reinforcement learning has come a long way. We really nailed yeah, the card pull. A lot of games, <laughs> right? That's so. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, I, I do think like still realistic applications. There have been very few real use cases of deep reinforcement learning, especially the ones at scale, right? So I think like kind of. I mean, it's perfectly fine to say we can solve games that are hard for humans by training on billions of examples, but it's a very different ball game to ask, how would we solve robotics? How would we automate manufacturing? How would we uh, you know, like, uh, really do automated machine learning in the en at the end of the day, right? The holy grail is you know, ultimately you know, in their own backyard, in their homes, people would kind of, you know, without even thinking, keep training and personalizing their different AI f tools and frameworks in, say, their personal devices in their home or at work. And we have, you know, that's a long way. Um, in light, right now, I mean, it, uh, it, ha it has become a lot easier than what it was 10 years ago. The software frameworks have gotten amazingly good. The computational scale has been growing every day. Uh, we are even uh, close to breaking the exascale barrier. So the progress there has been amazing, but there is still, I think, algorithmic progress to be done to ask how we can exploit that to make it more seamless, you know, to go from like raw data to answers to a fully working AI system with almost no intervention, right? We are so far from that dream today. So what other really concrete, um, th you know, Technologies or you know working use cases would you have expected ten years ago that you're you're surprised not to have seen progress on today? 
think this is a case where we've had a lot of progress, but you know, I would, I'm surprised that we haven't solved these problems. So I think there are lots of opportunities for using machine learning very profitably in healthcare, but um, for a large part, you know, there's lots of problems that are essentially a prediction problem, which is like bread and butter machine learning, supervised learning problems, classify this patient as someone who's going to respond or not, or class, you know, stratify this patient in the following way. But the major barrier is actually data collection. We don't have, we have you know, small data sets of patients that are heavily guarded. We don't have any good way of aggregating them across centers. Um, different people like different features, so there's no standardization. And that's become one of the principal barriers, I think, to solving a, a lot of these problems and making a lot of headway. And the cases I think when we have had the big successes are when you know, institutions spend a lot of time and effort pulling the data together to get, um, to get the better solutions. And yeah, so I find that surprising. Cool. Uh, by the way, Lester, if you hold your mic a little lower down, lower, lower. yeah. Put it right. We'll let Jeff help you out. Uh, so do you want to speak to, to this That's question of? Uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. You got upgraded. Okay. Just make sure you turn the other one. Oh, I'm, and now I'm off. Oh, I'm good. All right, it's back on. I'm, I'm, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, it's very important. Um, <laughs> So one, talking about healthcare, one thing that comes to mind is, um, so working in Compio and at the intersection of Compio and medicine, what I've seen is describing your uncertainty over your predictions is super important. And, uh, and yet you are kind of, in, in healthcare applications in particular, kind of split in two fields. We either have kind of poor predictors that give you uncertainty estimates that are calibrated and they're useful, um, but then they're so wide that they are very rarely actionable, um, or you get these very good predictors, but then we cannot estimate nice calibrated uncertainty estimates from them. So it's it's uh, that's a big challenge for our because in some sense the data doesn't come until people see the usefulness, uh, clinicians in particular. Um, and it was uh, when when I was in the UK, I was sitting on this uh, in this meeting where there was the. Um, healthcare regulatory agency and they were thinking of using machine learning that was in 2013 2012 and they were thinking of using machine learning but they couldn't they were like okay so we we know we can use machine learning but how do we how, how do we know it's useful and you could say oh we, you can develop personalized interventions and they were like we, we already do we look at the patient <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but you said no but these are new like these, these are informed by data and they say well we are informed by data we are we have case studies and so on so it was it was a hard sell and until we showed that these predictors give you nice predictions that that you can throw error bars around uh it's going to be hard yeah, I agree with that completely. I think we have a big evaluation problem in machine learning. This is something that people think about in statistics all the time, I imagine, in econometrics all the time, much less so in machine learning. And it's an even bigger problem when it comes to just small data. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of our time thinking about big data. Um, that has lots of challenges. But you know, small data has some very different sorts of challenges. And one of them is just wrapped up in evaluation. For instance, if I can't even withhold data to tell how well my method is doing, how do I know if this is working? And how can I prove to someone that this is going to be useful for their field? You know, we often rely on things like cross-validation, but how good is cross-validation? This is something, this is, I think, a, a surprising thing. People have been using cross-validation forever. Decades before I got to grad school, people were using cross-validation. We still don't know how it works. We don't know if it's providing a good estimate of the thing it's estimating. It's only under these very extreme circumstances that we know that. Basically, we know it's good if training error is a good estimate of uh, your error. Um, that's a huge open question that, you know, still has been unanswered. Is, is still unanswered, but um, we still use it left and right in machine learning. So, so I would, sorry, please. Now I would add to that, like saying, uh, you know, what I'm surprised is we as a research community, how little we've been able to enforce reproducibility and really asking if this progress, like the claim progress in the papers is real, right? Especially in reinforcement learning. I mean, Joel Pinot has. <laughs> 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 I mean, I mean, you know, Joel Pino has uh, like a long list of like papers which were not reproducible. <laughs> when I say reinforcement learning, I mean the more recent deep, deep reinforcement learning <laughs> papers, right, to clarify. Uh, because they're run at scale. I mean, they're run with just so few initializations. There is, you know, the code is sometimes not even released. The hyperparameters are not released. <laughs> so I'm just surprised that how we as a community kind of are not able to 
uh, you know, put this down into our conferences and say, no, you know, if you're claiming a result, you really have to back it up. But just one point towards that, though. It, it sometimes is just, imp so let's say that um, people release hyperparameters code and architecture, whatever they're doing, which is the case for, for instance, for something we're working on, which is neural architecture search. How do you find the architectures of neural networks? So some of the comparisons that we need to perform take 3,160 days, <laughs> GPU days to fit. <laughs> so, okay, so Microsoft, maybe we can take offline my GPU and just for 300, uh, for 3,000 days and just crunch on it. But, but broad reproducibility, I think it's, it's limited now by computation. So maybe NVIDIA should. Uh, <laughs> 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 any, any last words, Victor, before we uh, move on? Yeah, so yeah, I, I would say there are, there are multiple uh, disappointments uh, as well as uh, uh, simultaneously opportunities. So one, uh, yeah, one is disappointment, because we were just discussing this, with, 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 with actually, with Vasilis, an analyst of mission, is like, the, yeah, this cross-validation, that people use it, they don't know why it works, how it works. Uh, that's, that's one. The personalized prediction is, a, a personalized treatment effects is, is, a, is a big buzzword, but I'm really skeptical. I think it's, uh, it's been a failure. I mean, I'll be surprised if somebody can do actually confidence bars on those, but I'll be really surprised. <laughs> um, um, and so it's like a big, a big, a big unsolved pr problem uh, from, from, from my point of view. Um, anything about deep learning, like on the theory side, is also like a big, big puzzle, like expressive uh, properties of, uh, of deep nets, the uh, generalization properties. Now, there's a lot of work, but we're still very far from. Thanks. Okay, so, so now I'd like to ask all of you to think uh, into sort of the arbitrary future. Um, what do you think the most surprising things that machine learning will ultimately be able to do uh, that, that right now uh, machine learning isn't making much headway with? What, what do you think kind of are the limits of, uh, of progress in machine learning, the sort of most, the, the biggest machine learning dreams that we should have? I would say neural programming. Like ultimately, when and even neural research, like you know, when we you know ultimately, machines would be able to program themselves based on what they observe. You know, there may be some axioms they are given and some, you know, initial training, but then after that, they can interact and they can really, you know, uh, come up with uh, laws and inferences and make new hypotheses. Go back, do further experiments. And to do that in all different fields, right? Like how we, you know, think about the universe, how we think about the laws of physics, how we discover new materials. I mean, there's still a distant future, but that would be an exciting future. I think um, neural boy bands will probably be. <laughs> <laughs> Don't those exist already? <laughs> <laughs> neural boy bands, you know. I think a lot of our music will be generated by machine learning, and we'll actually like to listen to it. I think that that's coming. <laughs> Watch for it. I'm going to patent it. <laughs> Already publicly disclosed it. You're going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think machine learning on memory and CPU constrained devices is completely underexploited right now. Um, so, an intern this summer, she was really, uh, Karen Kim, she was really into drones, and she gave me like a you know, one of those drones off the internet. Uh, I don't want to infer the cost, but let's say $20 drone or whatever. Uh, that drone does very simple things. Basically, has, it has no real CPU that you can think of. But imagine deploying a, a super simple deep reinforcement learning model on, uh, on, on that drone. You could do very interesting things. You can, if you can deploy machine learning models in tiny devices, you can, now the kind of the spectrum of applications expands incredibly. People are thinking of putting mini devices in your toilet to measure your microbiome. Uh, maybe not connected to Wi-Fi, just keep them offline. But but, <laughs> but, uh, but you could inter there are so many interesting applications, and that right now we are doing huge scale machine learning on on you know with teraflops of power. But you can imagine smaller microflops. All right, Victor, we've got boy bands and smart toilets. What else do you? <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, it, anyone else want to jump in on that? You're allowed to, to say more than one thing, but if not, I'll, I'll move on. 
And you, you've been a really a, a bundle of contradictions about deep reinforcement learning, right? You, I, you I want to balance the. <laughs> uh, I should, I should provide a balanced. Uh, but you know, we are think we are thinking 2050, 2060, so it will work. <laughs> <laughs> Hope springs eternal. Okay. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, they, you, you guys aren't dreaming big enough. Oh, I forgot about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what about predicting the next session? Okay, so let, let's not steal from the next session. As we're we're being warned. Um, so, so uh, ha having talked about the, uh, the you know the, the amazing things that we might someday be able to do, you know, machines that can program themselves, boy bands that can program themselves. Um, what are oh, the like things? <laughs> toilets. I wasn't going to go there again. But, you know, we all remember that. Um, what do you think of the things, the, the fundamental limits of machine learning are? What are the things that machine learning really is never going to be able to do? That, you know, really it'll, it'll stop being machine learning once, when, once you know, certain kinds of problems that are still kind of within scope for computer science really will, will never be part of ML. I mean, I don't think there is a limit. If we think of, I mean, between machine learning and artificial intelligence, you know, between the terminologies, do people have that differentiation, right? But if you don't, if you just talk about, if we can, you know, say, have an adaptive system that can really understand the environment around it and keep learning and keep adapting, I don't see any limits um, when we get there. Well, I guess I want to encourage you to think about machine learning kind of narrowly rather than sort of anything yeah. that might be called yeah. artificial intelligence, because I think <laughs> that makes it too easy. So, so I really want to think about, you know, learning from data maybe as distinct from reasoning. Got it, got it. I think there, I mean, the limits are precisely the data itself, right? Like uh, it's garbage in, garbage out. So it's really then up to the researchers and the engineers to ask, and you know, the experts in that domain to ask what is the data that's relevant to this task? How do I specify the task? What is the objective function? How do I evaluate it? And that's inherently the limitations too, because those could keep changing, and it gets harder and harder to seamlessly adapt to different ones. And there may be conflicting uh, objectives, right? How do we reconcile all that? Thoughts from the rest of you? You don't have to keep going in the same order, but you can if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that completely. Um, I think the biggest limit is just going to be the data that we've collected, um, the data that we present to our algorithms. Um, I imagine this will come up again in a, a future panel, um, but we see that you know if you're dealing with a biased data set, you're only going to be learning about those same biases. You're going to be incorporating those biases into your learned models. Um, I think this is going to become more and more important as we think about interpretability, because that, in essence, is a human concept. When we say interpretability, we mean that you, some person, is able to interpret this. How do we know what that means to that person? We have to query that person. We have to query that field often. And unless we're, inc we're incorporating that into our algorithms as well, we can't really solve the interpretability problem. And, and in all the cases where I've had to deal with um, training machine learning models and then handing them off to someone in a, a field that's supposed to be benefiting from this, I'm asked, you know, what does this mean? Why are these predictions being made? And inevitably, I have to work with that person to understand what the model is doing. I think we can push a little bit further in producing models that tend to be easier to interpret, but I think without that extra human element, and hence also the data produced by those people, um, it's a lost cause. Yeah, something, something that Emma said in addition to the data was um, deciding the objective function. And, uh, and that's, from my own work in computational biology, that turned out to be where I spent most of my time, right? Uh, yes, the data was one, maybe 30% of the time, and then 70% was what are we trying to optimize for? Uh, because we have great function approximators, right? In machine learning, you, you, you want to learn a function. You, you, if you have the right data, you will learn that function. The problem is that how do you define what you want to learn? And, um, and it was, uh, I was on Twitter last night, and somebody, as you, as you do, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and there was somebody who was training an agent to walk. And, uh, and uh, basically, the, the system could design the length of the legs and the articulations and the speed at which it walks. And basically, the objective was to reach um, kind of like a, a goal line after many obstacles. And basically, the system without constraints just designed super long legs that basically made the entire agent collapse at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so 
Obje it's objective sneaky. achieved, like uh, <laughs> reward 100. So, um, so, so, so then they start constraining the length of the legs, and, uh, and now it does keeping. But, but this is the problem, right? If you just let it go on an objective function without thinking, it will just find shortcuts. Uh, there was a thing like where there was um, a rocket. Another, another one of those uh, toy problems was designing a rocket that goes up. Uh, and then lands in another location. So what the what the system found without constraints from physics was if you go underground, uh, it it actually consumes less energy. <laughs> so so it actually designed the rocket to just point down and just. <laughs> dig. Yeah. So, so what should we take from this? Uh, it, uh, um, the human. So as much as I, so a lot of my work now is about automating and automated machine learning. Um, the human still. As much as I want that to be that that kind of result to be achieved, I think the human will still need to be the 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 entity that decides what you're learning, like directing the learning towards something. Um, and so that's I think something that will never probably automate or solve completely because uh, the, you know if you especially you specify an objective, the system will go you know it will do anything to achieve it. And now you start specifying too many constraints, and then you have other problems. So that's a big problem that I, maybe due to lack of imagination, cannot see how it would solve. And to add to that, right, I think even some of the critical failures that will come about and that have come about will be fr more human failures than the machine learning or AI. Like in the media, it will be easy to say, oh, look, AI failed. I mean, the famous one is the Uber accident of, you know, where the pedestrian was actually detected by the t sensor, so it was not a technological failure. But it was a f failure in terms of, like, you know, how the processing did not reach like the end decision, right? And and so if the system was extensively tested, it would have been definitely caught uh, because, you know, there is, we all know about false alarm and uh, detection curves. So we can like ask where are we in that operating, what is the operating point in that curve? And so it was, and then make a decision based on that. And so in this case, you know, like either it slipped through or that was, you know, it was decided that we would just like you know, have this human driver who would just kind of take care of any failure of uh, machine learning, uh, but that's again not taking into account the human attention spans. I, you know, like kind of if they're continuously driving forever and the chances of failure are are tiny, but when they happen, they're catastrophic, right? So I think we'll uh, still face a lot of challenges in many such domains where AI system will be in the loop with a critical. Uh, decision making and even having human or many humans m may not be the solution. Well, so Niccolo and, and Anima both in, in your last responses kind of raised this idea of how people are going to be reacting kind of in real time to uh, deployed ML systems. And mm -hmm. I think this really touches on this question of the, the limits of ML. Uh, it's, it seems like right now, you know, we haven't gotten very good sort of socially at understanding these limits and understanding the boundaries of where these systems break down, how we ought to interact with them. Uh, do you guys think this is something that we're going to get better at? Do you think the systems are going to have to adapt in a way to make it easier for us to do this? And you know, if so, do you have any thoughts on you know, what that might look like? Are, are things going to get worse as these systems get more widely deployed? Um, possibly, yeah. So I think there is, so now there is, and uh, there are people working on it, but there is still, uh, com com compared to the size of the problem and the size of the machine learning field, there is a very narrow contact surface in the between, which is HCI work, human-computer interaction. So um, things such as understanding and visualizing uncertainty, um, providing it to the uh, as a feedback to the to the human operator or, or the human making decision is still something that is poorly understood and uh, and. Uh, to be developed, there is some there is some work, but it's very specific, right? Uh, uh, last night at dinner, I was talking about uh, there is an app called Dark Sky uh, that does now casting of the weather, which is very useful in Boston because you don't want to get soaked, um, and uh, and it predicts basically a time series of rain intensity, and uncertainty estimate is super important because people and there is a whole book about it, uh, which actually our social media collective read, which was about. Um, following the National Weather Service uh, and kind of studying how they think about uncertainty and predictions. It's called Masters of Uncertainty. And um, but for, so for, for weather prediction, uncertainty 
conveying uncertainty about your, your prediction is super important. And this time series, the, the way the app does it, it shows basically a smooth kind of like Gaussian process looking line that shows the boundaries of the uncertainty. And stuff like that is absolutely brilliant because it, tell, it allows you to understand what's going on, but it's very narrowly focused on some domains right now. And we need more contact surface. But it seems like it allows you to know what's going on if you're already very good at thinking about uncertainty. Mm -hmm. It seems like you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the broad population you know, has a lot of trouble thinking about uh, you know, probabilistic statements. You know, are, are we going to get better as a society because we're going to be so surrounded by these things, or are the systems going to have to adapt? Uh, I think uh, we will need to get more educated about it. So, for instance, for the elections, right? The New York Times is another version of these uncertainty estimates things, where you have a dial that goes Republican or Democrat, and they added like a jitter uh, to show the uncertainty <laughs> around. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in the exactly, the jitter in the beginning was terrifying. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And then it turned out, uh, <laughs> uh, and it was going from side to side, showing broad and certain estimates. And so people actually turn it off. And uh, in the most recent, I think it was the midterms, uh, not the midterms, but uh, you know, filling the vacancies. They, the New York Times didn't have it anymore, I think. So people just asked to be. I mean, we, we shouldn't discuss politics, and we do that <laughs> at our peril. But see, there we go. You see. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. I, and I'm, I'm reminded of the the last presidential election where. You know, at the last minute, uh, Clinton was uh, forecast to win by something like 70-30. And then, you know, when, when the unexpected thing happened, everyone said, how were the polls so wrong? It's like, well, sometimes 30% probability things happen. <laughs> it, it, it seems it, like... They even exactly. At that, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you know, if you have a well-calibrated model, they should be happening 30% exactly, of the time. Exactly, if you have a... Yeah. <laughs> and uh, somehow people don't, don't even seem to think that way, even about binary choices. So what, what hope do we have about, you know, richer model spaces? I don't have an answer. <laughs> Anybody else? And I, I, I think this is further, I think, um, you know, it's going to be harder if you, you know, assign like a human-like nature to the systems or especially robots or, you know, things that look like a human, right? Or a car that you think is being driven by a human, but it's not. So you tend to assign the same kind of qualities and the same kind of behavioral response from a human. And so there, I think, a lot of maybe even if we give uncertainty estimates, you kind of ignore all that and you just go back to you know, how you would expect a human to react. And I think that's even more dangerous. Well, well I guess this, this comes back to your notion before of objective functions and also mm -hmm. a point that Victor brought up before about kind of causal reasoning, about really being able to you know, ascribe some kind of uh, causal motivation. Uh, it seems to me that th this is another place where machine learning has been very fruitful, but also where there's sort of an inherent tension about reasoning from data because um, you, you want to understand something counterfactual. You don't necessarily want to understand only what the data has to tell you. Uh, is there an inherent limit there? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually interesting how, how different fields think about the same questions in very different ways. So I spent like two days in Tübingen with Bernard Sholkov. Um, and so his lab is, uh, is devoting all of its attention now to causal questions of causal inference. Uh, and, and then they, they, they want to automate the causal uh, uh, discoveries. But it seems like uh, it's really hard to, like, to do so without contextual knowledge. Mm -hmm without experts being brought in and so on. Uh, uh, just a like, really simplistic approach is saying, let's assume that we have a DAG or something like this, like the, 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 a, co uh, a diagram without, uh, without cycles. The, um, uh, and then let's just discover it. It often goes wrong. Like it would go wrong in supply demand uh, systems, right? Because it's not really a DAG and so on. And without knowing the context, I think it would, could, could go terribly wrong. So it, I don't know how to automate this and so on. And so people mentioned here quantification of uncertainty here. I don't think we all agree on what, uh, what the uncertainty means. Like, I, I mean, I would be surprised, again, like if somebody has a good quantification of uncertainty for deep, deep neural nets, like if, they, if you have a pr prediction for, for based on them, I would be interested in, in seeing a confidence interval, uh, the classical one. Um, the frequentist one, just to, to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, but, but, and, and it's even for prediction. The, the counterfactual prediction is much, much harder because we have to create 
unbiased signals ab ab about the treatment effects or causal effects and, and the, the constructions, of, constructions of such unbiased signals often relies on experiments. Experiments are not available for the most interesting questions, research questions that we have. Like, yeah, the experiments can be used to uh, uh, measure short-run effects that give you an idea about um, the, 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 the true causes, but we're so far away from, from, uh, from uh, learning long-run effects and from automating the, lear the learning. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for the, this is the first thing that spurred our audience to spontaneous <laughs> active enthusiasm. <laughs> And I think going back to your question about you know how will we adapt through this basically new world, I think I think we have to. Um, but when I say we, I really mean the younger generations. So we're, we're old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's Why a new do you world. have so little faith in the older generations? <laughs> it's a new world. We're old, but I, I think there is hope for education. I think a lot of universities are already starting to integrate you know statistical education into like the standard curriculum for all students. Um, I've seen data science 101 courses popping up at places like Stanford and Berkeley. Um, I think we need to go farther back than that because now we already have, I mean, these systems are being deployed. We already have machine learning systems that are just, you know, helping to decide who's going to get released on bail. That means that's affecting your, li your life and what's going to happen, you know, whether you end up in jail or released with your family. And that's going to happen more and more. Um, so it means the new generations will have to be educated on these things. So I think it is difficult to take someone you know, like me and to be retrained into thinking about uncertainty, but I think if we start early, we can. <laughs> so we shouldn't even have faith in former stats professors from Stanford? To even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no hope for the rest of us. Point estimates, catch them early. That's, that should be the public health. So, so should calculus uh, in high schools be replaced by statistics? Ooh. Yes. Should, yes. Augmented. <laughs> augmented, I would say. Yes. Now, what are you going to kick out? <laughs> Calculus. We can't say augmented. <laughs> Stochastic calculus. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best like kind. That. Okay, so we, we've talked a bunch about the uh, the limits of ML. Um, you know, both you know how ML is going to grow, and also you know what what maybe ultimately is going to constrain it. Um, if we imagine that you know all of our machine learning dreams are realized, machine learning takes its you know appropriate place at the center of computer science, uh, ruling the world. <laughs> uh, what other areas of computer science um, and and maybe of the sciences more generally are going to increase in importance um, because of their the kind of inherent um, complementarity to to the, the place the machine learning will ultimately reach. And I, mean, I think this is particularly important given that uh, MSR New England is such an interdisciplinary place. So we're here really to celebrate MSR New England. And I think you know, in, in the kind of interdisciplinary lab of the future, you know, if you're going to be centered on ML, you know, who else do you need to make sure you have around? I mean, so I, you know, at Caltech as well, like, you know, it's a very interdisciplinary place, right? And we recently launched AI for Science with the goal of really having AI make an impact in all areas of sciences. And so to me, like, yes, you know, there should be a central overarching machine learning uh, affecting all the fields, but ultimately it also has to bring in all the domain experts, you know, so transfer some of the machine learning knowledge to them and for them to also further develop machine learning, right? So it's not going to be like a few of uh, machine learning researchers just solving all the world's problems. You know, I think that would be also too arrogant to think that a few of us could do that, uh, but instead it would really be machine learning itself getting democratized, spreading its wings, and the basic you know, grounding is present for all sciences, in fact, all kind of, all the areas of education, including the arts, right? And then, you know, it's up to every researcher and every field to say, what is, I know, how is this going to be relevant to me? And how can I further develop? What are the domain constraints I have? You know, is it the small data regime? Is it the large data? Is it the interactive learning? Uh, is it, uh, you know, mostly kind of online learning? So all these, like, you know, what aspect is really relevant to my field and how do I value it, right? So we have to really broaden machine learning rather than centralize it. Uh, when I was a graduate student at Berkeley, um, I was part of this interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary lab, which was um, called the Rad Lab. So it was essentially machine, it was a systems plus machine learning lab, but it, the goal was, the goal of the machine learning piece was to develop machine learning that would be useful for systems. Um, by the end of my time at grad school, it had been replaced by a new lab called the AMP Lab, 
And again, it was the systems and machine learning lab, but then it was about building systems that would support machine learning. And I think that's been a crucial part to you know, scaling up machine learning, dealing with the, all the big data problems that we have, um, making use of parallel processing, dealing with cloud computing. So systems in particular, I think, is one really good, I think there are a number of answers, but that's one particular area that we need. Yeah, I think that, that would have been one of my answers to the, the first question about what's been surprising in uh, the last 10 mm -hmm. years is the extent to which breakthroughs in ML have been systems breakthroughs yes. rather than, than theory breakthroughs. Um, I should say GPU, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a softball to you, for sure. Um, well, probably it's easy to see because it's such a strength of the New England lab, but um, the combination of quantitatively minded people and qualitatively minded people is is a powerful one. Um, so having humanists around uh, and engaging with them is 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 a crazy powerful combination. And um, because sometimes in machine learning, it's easy to get uh, tangled up in just I can answer this, so why not do it? And uh, and sometimes it's useful to direct your attention to what should you really answer, not just because you can, but just because you should. Uh, and those usually are the harder questions that are more profound, and, uh, and it's useful to have people who kind of bathe you in, in those ideas. And, and to comment to along that line, right, so you know, these days I give talks to broad audiences and also around the world, uh, you know, like uh, really uh, reach out to, you know, people with maybe not having the math background and so, so so many of them worry like how do I participate in this machine learning revolution how do I you know I want to learn but where do I start and uh, and so that's been another great thing there are efforts like fast.ai and mm -hmm. other community efforts that are really making it easy for people to not only deploy machine learning but to write simple code to have very accessible examples and I think it's so crucial that we make the education about machine learning and in through a corollary, even math, right? Like much more kind of accessible to broad population with maybe who may be thinking in different ways. And that's the only way we are going to make progress by involving humanity uh, in creating better machine learning and designing uh, better even, you know, forms of machine learning. So, yeah. And, uh, I think online education is important. Like I could say, um, I've benefited a lot from Andrew Eng's course in deep learning. I just I love the programming and so on. Learned a lot. Uh, very easy. To, like for, for a busy person, it's really nice tool. Um, second, um, I think we, uh, it's the c community is really important. Um, I really enjoyed my time at MSR. Like you have great community. Like really open, uh, open-minded people coming from different fields and working together, discussing and uh, breaking uh, language barriers and so on. Th that was fantastic. In some ways, what we have now at the, at the Center for Statistics and da Data Science is very similar in nature. You have different people coming from different, different departments working in stats and machine learning, broadly defined. Um, we created ed educational programs like minor in stats, uh, dual de PhD program in uh, in uh, in X in statistics, say mathematics and statistics, or economics and statistics, and so on. Um, we uh, w I think we, we have the best uh, well we have the best seminar I believe like it's called stochastic and statistics seminar. It's like the the, the I'm a, I really love the seminar. Uh, lots of people come in. It's really really nice uh, uh, presentations with theorems and proofs and. And so on. <laughs> uh, uh, what could be better? Than yeah. That? <laughs> yeah. So we uh, yeah we started this uh, undergraduate new undergraduate program, which is a, um, a, B a bachelor of science in uh, um, computer science, economics, and data science. So that's I think that's uh, going to be a, a big changer, a game changer for, for for us at least. So. Well, so to connect something that came up in a lot of your different answers, I, I particularly liked. Uh, what uh, Niccolo said about uh, you humanists uh, being being useful um, you may <laughs> <laughs> to, to this broader enterprise of machine learning, um, and, and you know, maybe connecting to uh, what Lester was saying about uh, you know, the new generation. Uh, but I imagine that you're um, you know an aspiring um, academic uh, in some area that you, you're never going to be a machine learning researcher, but but you believe that machine learning is is going to be you know a really important part of the future. Um, you know, maybe you're you're a social scientist. Maybe you're you're a, a theorist. Maybe you're a, 
uh, you know, scientist in some other discipline. Uh, what do you need to do differently compared to maybe the, the generation of academics before you in, in your own discipline to, to be better positioned to be working um, you know, as part of this machine learning enterprise, to be working alongside ML people? The very first is the data, right? So I would say, you know, what, you know, can you have, can you, are you able to kind of put together the data that's there in the field? Maybe it's in disparate forms and, you know, maybe there's even missing ones, but at the very least, can you try to bring that all together and ask, uh, you know, by uh, combining the data sets and even collecting new data, can I really now uh, answer questions I couldn't before? And, uh, and working with the uh, machine learning scientists, I think it has to be a close collaboration because that's the only way, like, kind of, you know, uh, both the sides can uh, learn from each other. So, so those are the two things I would say. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think the only thing I would add was probably try to get a job from Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> Working together on problems, you know, like you, 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 you have a scientist that has a domain knowledge and has a problem. Um, uh, he or she should be able to uh, approach and talk a machine learning scientist to help solve the problem. There should be common uh, educational base to be able to speak, to get on the same page quickly. I, I mean, uh, I guess I want to yeah. open that box a little bit, though. I, I don't mm. just want to talk about the value of talking together or the value yeah. of having a job from Jennifer. You know, I, want the, <laughs> I want the recipe for having a job from Jennifer. Right? <laughs> what, what is the skill set that people are going to need? What are they going to have to actually you know, develop as you know, a toolkit to be able to, to engage in those collaborations usefully? So, you know, at Caltech, we have now a new data science major and minor that's, you know, across campus anybody can take, right? So the, the minor especially. So I think augmenting, like, the core area or the core major with a minor in data science would be a great start because you have the fundamentals. And if you're out of school to, you know, do the online courses to, you know, I tell a lot of, uh, you know, candidates that I get who want to get into machine learning, I point them to the resources. These Jupyter notebooks are great. They have explanations, but they also have working code to really hands-on try it on different data sets, you know, explore the failure modes, right? I think that's what really distinguishes somebody with a surface knowledge of machine learning and somebody who is deeper is, okay, why are things failing? How do I debug? How do I resolve that? Uh, and to participate in online forums. I mean, there's just so much activity happening online and even in meetups and workshops. So there's a lot of community-driven efforts, and I think being part of it would be a great start. Yeah, let, let me give you an example from that, that I've seen with my own eyes. So I, during my, my PhD, I was in an Institute for Translational Neuroscience. So I was, we were a machine learning group embedded with biologists. And uh, these biologists received training, uh, some of them like, 10 years ago, 12 years ago at the time. And uh, you know, they went through stats and math courses and computer science, basic computer science courses. But for a lot of them, it was not a core, um, a core coursework. So they, they it was just pass or fail. Yeah, you pass stats. Um, um, good job. So then they realized, and then there was this machine learning group, and our goal was to kind of work at the intersection of fields, and they would come with their microarray data, at the time it was microarrays, and they would say, okay, I would need to under understand differential expression between uh, a brain tissue that has the disease and brain tissue that doesn't have the disease. And we would, you know, being machine learning people, we whip up something, uh, calculate a p-value and whatnot. Uh, then they realized that the turnaround time was long, that we maybe didn't super look at calibration of uh, the p-values, um, that uh, sometimes when you fit things, you, you do multiple comparisons, you should control. We were controlling, but you can control in better ways. So they understood, okay, so these people are busy, they're doing their you know, machine learning papers, why don't we pick it up ourselves? And so they started getting their own training in stats, and we rapidly found that once they got this training in stats, they would be super competitive with what we could come up with. We could basically get 95% of the way there, but because that the training, then they could communicate more effectively with us mm -hmm what, what they would their wishes were from the system. And so we, at that point, there was this feedback loop where we could understand better what they were looking for. They understood better what our <coughs> models were doing. And so they learned more machine learning. We learned more biology. Um, and, and that was like a virtuous cycle. 
I mean, I, I'm a bit surprised that so far the answers you guys are giving are about how people in other disciplines should sort of learn some machine learning themselves to sort of <laughs> do, st do I said stats Don't or, or stats, <laughs> but but should you know kind of learn the toolkit that ML people have to to sort of um, you know, meet in the middle. Uh, I'm, I guess as you know, wearing sort of an economics hat, I'm particularly excited by the idea of complements. You know, what are you know entirely different things where people might lean in an opposite direction to really develop a, a skill set that ML people don't have, but that's going to be really relevant in a, in a world with a lot of ML people. Human interaction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, so I think that. I mean, to be more serious, it'll be uh, really important in the future, right? So it's not just a mathematical ability, but to communicate uh, to different areas, to you know, uh, empathize with the difficulties that different sections of population have, or or different fields are facing. So how we can you know learn from others to you know help solve better problems. Yeah, this was a tough question because it was a many-to-one relationship, right? <laughs> if you define the set of all possible other fields and then you say, what's the complement that, that the machine learning doesn't have? It's a really tough no. uh, set to define. Um, so I don't have an answer. Well, you're almost out of time, so fair enough. Well, also, I feel like machine learning is largely like a field of immigrants. I mean, being a, a, a pretty young field, a lot of these people came in from from other aspects of other disciplines in computer science, from mathematics, from physics quite often. And so they all, I don't see, I guess I, I, I disagree with the thrust of the question in that I do think the best thing for them is to go and learn machine learning too, <laughs> and then augment their, their own skill set with that. I don't know, yeah, that, that's how I would approach it. Well, if I can't get you to disagree with each other, at least I can get you to disagree with me. <laughs> uh, so, so we're just in uh, the, the last seconds left. Um, let, let me uh, just invite you each to give some uh, closing thoughts if you have any sort of, you know, how do we get there from here? What, what are the things we should all be focusing on as a group to, to you know, realize the vision that we spent the, the last hour talking about? I mean, for me, it would be bridging theory and practice, right, to ask you know, like what are the current uh, blind spots in practice? Can we design better algorithms? And also, you know, really explore the failure modes of those algorithms and keep iterating so it's never kind of going to be, you know, it's always kind of, you know, go on, but to make it much more of a process that's easy to do and to focus more on data. Yes, for me, the most important things are okay, is breaking gaps between theory and practice. Uh, there's just a gigantic gap out there. And the second is breaking communication barriers. Like there's a lot of data science activities we need to go, we need to understand each other better. Yeah, I'd love to see a, a broader dissemination of, of problems. I think research tends to be, to be a bit myopic. We come up with a problem, we try to solve it ourselves, we can't solve it, we shelf it, shelf it and, and the problem dies, or maybe it's rediscovered you know, a decade later. Um, quite often, the pr we might know what the right problems are, but not the right solutions. I think we're at a, uh, a time where in the current in, in our current environment, it's very easy to reach out to the, the broad community. We already start to see this with machine learning competitions, for instance, where you know someone knows that there's an, a particular problem that needs to be solved. They're willing to like you know put out lots of money so somebody else can solve it, and you end up finding solutions from places where you wouldn't normally look, um, often from different disciplines. And I think that's probably the way forward for get to making the biggest contributions to humanity uh, broadly? Um, my main point is we should be worrying more about uh, good scholarship in machine learning. So there is this great paper that is on the archive, uh, which is uh, Troubling Trends in Machine Learning Scholarship. Uh, we are not always doing a great job disentangling, for instance, the sources of an empirical gain in performance. Um, and we should be thinking more about that. So people should read that paper and think about it. It's, it's a very interesting. Awesome. Great. Um, let's uh, let's thank all of our panelists for uh, thank you. Really enlightening thoughts. Uh,